Hello human geographers, we are back at it again this evening. Tonight we're going to be starting our next chapter, uh, the second part of Unit 2, which is on migration. Here we go. So as we usually do, let's go ahead and start out with a couple of the key vocabulary terms that we're going to be using in this particular chapter. As usual with vocabulary, we want to underline the important parts of the definition, but at the same time, make sure that you're adding information, you're adding examples, you're adding information to this slide. Here we go. We're starting out with the different types of movement and human movement is really about how different ideas, innovations diffuse around the world. So we start out with mobility, which is just all types of movement from one location to another, including temporary travel and migration. Now, I want to ask, what do you think differentiates migration from temporary travel? Make a prediction. Let's see if that actually shows up in the definition of migration here in just a moment. Now, as part of mobility, we include a couple of terms like activity space, which is the space within which daily activity occurs, not including those unusual exceptions. And so think about your activity space. It probably includes our high school. It probably includes your home. It might include if you play a sport or you're in a club or a band or orchestra or something like that. It might include some of those other areas that are part of the school or part of your normal routine. And commuting, which is just traveling to work and then back home again, is a type of movement that typically occurs in the activity space. So that movement that you take to get to school and then back home, we call that commuting. In addition to that, we also talk about periodic movement. Periodic movement is movement that involves temporary but recurrent relocation. For example, we got a couple there, college attendance, military service, but we've got another example for you. And the other example I want to include are a group of people called snowbirds. Snowbirds are typically older, wealthier residents of Canada as well as northern U.S. states who will move to the Sun Belt, southern parts of the United States, think Florida, Arizona, maybe you know southern Nevada, for warmer weather during the winter months. So they get out of the cold, they come down to the sunshine of the Sun Belt, and they stay there for a temporary but recurrent period of time. Hey, they're constantly doing that, but it's not a permanent move. If it was permanent, we would call that migration. Migration is a form of relocation diffusion involving the permanent or relatively permanent relocation of an individual or group to a new place of residence. So hopefully what you noticed at the very top was that temporary travel and migration, the thing that separates them, temporary, it's not permanent or relatively permanent, whereas migration is going to be on a more permanent basis. And then we have two different types of migration that we want to be able to differentiate, and these are going to be important. I anticipate seeing these a lot. Emigration and immigration. Emigration or e-migration is migration from a location. It's out-migration, e uh, it's the place is emptying. They are exiting, however you want to remember it. And then immigration is going to migration to a new location, in migration. And it's almost kind of in the title. Immigration sounds like in migration. They're coming in. And so we're able to calculate net migration, which is the difference between in migration and out migration in a particular area. So if emigration is greater than immigration, what we have is a net out-migration. And if immigration is greater than emigration, more people coming in than are coming out, then what you have is net in-migration. All right, so let's do what we normally do when we take a look at these types of maps. So what you see here is a map of net migration. So let's understand what we're looking at. First off, what type of map are we looking at? And what is the scale of analysis? At what scale are we analyzing this information, net migration? It's a choropleth map at the national scale. Now, let's understand what this map is. Let's take a look at the key because it's not super intuitive here. So the areas that are in red have net in migration. And to varying degrees, the darker shade has more in-migration. So that's a little intuitive. 
but the light purple is going to be net neutral migration. So emigration and immigration are in balance. It equals zero. Whereas the dark purple is going to be net out migration, net emigration. More people are leaving than are coming in. So let's ask a question that we typically ask on something like this. Is this a good indicator of development? And I would say generally no, but there are some patterns of development that are important for us to analyze. For example, notice here that Mexico has net out migration. Mexico is a semi-periphery state. And so where do you think the out migration from Mexico is typically going to? Well, they're probably leaving a semi-periphery state to go to a core state like the United States, like Canada. And so notice that both those countries have net in-migration. Okay? And notice that a lot of Latin American countries have net out-migration. And distance decay would suggest that they're probably going to go to an area that's fairly close. And what we'll see later in this chapter is that there's a predictive pattern that periphery and semi-periphery migrants usually go to core countries. Right? So also notice that Eastern Europe has net out migration. So where do you think they're going? Again, distance decay would suggest it's probably someplace close. And patterns of development would suggest that's probably a more developed region. Eastern Europe is generally semi-periphery. So they're heading to the core of Western Europe. Now, there are some exceptions to this because notice that countries like Somalia, Sudan, and Afghanistan all have varying degrees of in-migration. Now, the reality that is probably happening in these areas, each of these areas have had conflict for quite some time. So, probably what is happening is in the past, people were forced to leave. We call them refugees. We'll be talking about them later in this unit. If they're forced to leave because of conflict or something like that, when that conflict ends, people often return home, which we call repatriation. So probably what we're seeing in this map is the repatriation of refugees that in the past had left and now are returning home. So let's go ahead and take a look at some other types of migration. All right, so let's take a look at a few types of migration. Now, keep in mind, migration has to be long-term. It has to be permanent or relatively permanent and has to be outside of the community of origin. So it has to, you have to move someplace else, right? So these are some of the different types of migration that we could look at. Start out with transnational, also known as international migration. Uh, trans really just means that you're crossing something. It's across something. So transcontinental railroad was the railroad that crossed a continent. So in this case, you're crossing a national boundary. So transnational or international migration is a permanent movement from one country to another. Now, there's only about 168 million international migrants. Now, that sounds like a lot, 168 million people. That, that's a lot. But compared with the 7.5 billion people on the planet, it really only constitutes roughly about 3% of the world's population is living in another country, has crossed an international boundary, which means that most migration is internal. It's a permanent movement within a particular country. Now, there's a couple other types of migration. So we'll start with chain migration, which is the migration of people to a specific location because relatives, friends, or members of the same nationality previously migrated there. Now, I'll actually give you a, a personal example in my life. Uh, part of the reason why I live in Las Vegas, in Southern Nevada, is because when my parents were deciding where to move, I moved out here when I was eight, so I wasn't included in the decision-making process. Part of why they moved out here was because they already had family. That's what chain migration is, is just moving where you know someone, you have a relative, a friend, something like that. It's not a guarantee of migration, it's just a pattern of migration. And one of the things that comes about as a result of chain migration are ethnic enclaves. It'll be a vocabulary term in a later chapter, but essentially you probably have already heard of these before. It's a small community of people with the same basic ethnic background. So 
Examples could include things like Chinatown, Little Italy. These are groups of people that migrated to a particular spot because other people of the same ethnicity or nationality had previously moved there. And so chain migration is something where we oftentimes see a migrant move to a particular location and then they tell friends about it. They tell family members about it. Hey, whether uh, they're, they're communicating through phone, written, whatever it is, hey, they're oftentimes creating a positive perception of that per particular location. And then when someone does move there, a lot of times that previous migrant can offer assistance through housing, finding a job, uh, communicating. And so chain migration is migration through kinship links, people, friends, families, things like that. Again, it's not a guarantee of migration. It's just a pattern of migration. Step migration is migration to a distant location that often occurs in stages. And I have a few countries that we tend to see more step migration in. Morocco, Tunisia, and Libya are three countries in North Africa um, that are destinations, yes, but they're also temporary stopping places for people who are migrating oftentimes from Southwest Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa towards Europe. And so that tends to be a stop on their way to Europe. Next one that we see on there is a form of seasonal agricultural migration called transhumans, which is a seasonal periodic movement of pastoralists and their livestock between highland and lowland pastures. Now, transhumans is different than typical nomadism because the pastoralists will take up long periods of residence in a new location. So for example, um, Switzerland, they'll move up into the highlands during the summer, which aren't available during the winter, it's too cold. And so during the summers, they'll move up into the highlands and they'll stay up there. They'll graze their livestock and things like that. Also in the Horn of Africa, we're going to see hundreds of thousands of pastoralists and their livestock follow seasonal rainfall patterns and the new grazing grounds that come after the rains. And then our final type of migration on this particular slide is rural to urban migration. And just make sure that you understand what rural is and what urban is. So it mentions on their permanent move from an agrarian lifestyle, that's rural, that's gonna be the countryside, farmland, things like that, to a city lifestyle, that's gonna be urban. Continuing with the different types of migration, we have two broad categories of, of migration, and those are voluntary and forced. Both of these are definitions, so here we go. Voluntary migration is a permanent movement undertaken by choice, so the migrant gets to choose to migrate, even if, after they weigh all the choices and options, they make that choice desperately or irrationally. If there's a choice, that's going to be voluntary migration. And a lot of times economics is a driving force in voluntary migration. The other type is forced migration. This is a permanent migration flow in which the movers have no choice but to relocate. And it's usually compelled by cultural factors. So voluntary oftentimes is driven by economics. Forced a lot of times is going to be cultural. And cultural can fall, there's a lot of different things that fall under that umbrella of cultural factors. So violence against a particular religious or ethnic group, um, political violence are elements that could fall into that as well. And this is oftentimes known as involuntary migration. So a couple examples uh, from history. The transatlantic slave trade, the triangle trade that we discussed before, the Atlantic arm of that where somewhere between 12 million to as high as 30 million Africans were forcibly relocated. This is the largest forced migration in human history. A more contemporary example would be the Syrian civil war, which began in 2011, forced half the population to flee, resulting in over 6 million internally displaced persons within Syria and another 4 million refugees who crossed an international border. Human trafficking is actually another example of forced migration. 
And human trafficking a lot of times doesn't get discussed as, as a form of migration, but people are being forcibly taken and trafficked. And this could include things like sex trafficking, forced labor, involuntary domestic servitude, forced child labor, as well as the recruitment of child soldiers. And depending on where in the world you're talking about, these are some very big and very heavy issues. Now, sometimes it can be very difficult to determine whether or not a migration is forced or voluntary. And I'll give you an example. The mass emigration of migrants from Ireland to North America in the mid-1800s could be argued as a forced migration because of the Irish potato famine from, uh, from 1845 to 1852. However, there's an argument to be made that it could be seen as voluntary in that many of the Irish who were relocated, dislocated from Ireland, chose to go to North America from several other alternatives. So at the end of the day, the reality is voluntary migrants have an option, like where to go or what to do once they get there. Forced migrants do not. Another example of forced migration was in 1830. The U.S. government passed a piece of legislation called the Indian Removal Act which took lands from thousands of Native Americans and forcibly moved tribes to other areas of the country. Many were far away from their traditional and ancestral homelands. The Seminole were forcibly re relocated from Florida. The Creek and the Cherokee were moved from areas of Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And then the Choctaw and Chickasaw were moved from parts of Alabama, but mostly Mississippi. And they were forced to move from the southeastern part of the United States to what was then known as the Indian Territory, what's now Oklahoma, as a product of this. And you've probably heard of this before. It's more commonly called the Trail of Tears because so many people died on that route to what is now Oklahoma. 